Hi, this is Ushio. Welcome back to Sable's Grimoire. We have finally reached our dorm room. We started school, we missed the opening ceremony, but yeah, we're finally home. Finally dragging my eyes away from the door, I enter my dorm room at last. The moment I enter, I raise an eyebrow at the sight in front of me. Contrary to my expectations, I spy two beds, two desks, and the belongings of someone other than myself. As for the bed, the bottom bunk appears to be untouched, whereas the other has been neatly arranged with miscellaneous decorations scattered all around it. From the look of things, it would seem that my roommate has arrived ahead of me. I didn't expect to have a roommate. I thought that a huge academy like this would provide a separate room for each student, considering the relatively low number of students in attendance. Okay, as long as my roommate isn't violent or rowdy, I'm sure we'll get on fine. Hello? Anyone here? Hello? I walk through the room, turning my head left and right as I search for my roommate. Did my roommate come up here earlier before the opening ceremony, or did I just miss him? Shrugging my shoulders, I sit down on my own bed and begin to unpack. Although there isn't much for me to take out, there are at least some spare clothes and toiletries to put away. Even in this age where magic assists in the production of so many goods, running out of clean clothes is just as valid a concern as ever. Okay, that should do it. Now then, since my roommate isn't here, I guess I'll head back to the cafeteria and see... What? A moment before my hand touches the door, I freeze. The sound of the door unlocking, more akin to the sound of something decompressing, fills the entire room as I unintentionally go silent. Wings enter my line of sight, followed by smooth golden hair. Light footsteps encroach upon me, and before long I'm standing face to face with my roommate. Oh, hi, Tix is here. You must be my roommate, pleased to meet ya. Tix extends one of her tiny hands toward me as she stares into my eyes, waiting for me to respond. Oh yeah, likewise. I shake Tix's hand, careful not to exert too much force. So my roommate's a human, and a male one at that. Yeah, it seems like there was a mix-up with the room assignments. I've already informed our grades advisor, but honestly, it didn't seem like she was going to do anything about it. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that. In fact, chances are this arrangement is my mother's doing anyway. Your mother? Uh-huh. This is kind of embarrassing to admit, but you'll find out sooner or later anyway, so might as well be up front and just explain everything right off the bat. Let me get straight to the point. The truth is, I'm not here to study, or at least not to study magic. I actually enrolled at Amadronia in order to familiarise myself with males, and maybe even find a mate. Uh, come, come again. A mate, a spouse, a partner of the sexual variety. I don't know how much you know about pixies, but our race is 100% female. Naturally, this means that we need to crossbreed in order to survive as a species. Since there are no men in our societies, pixies generally venture into the domains of other races, find a mate, and then return home after they've been impregnated. And that's why you came to Amadronia? To become pregnant and then go home? Yep, that's the plan. Wow, talk about differences in culture. Pixies wander into the civilizations of other races, engage in one night stands until they get pregnant, and then head back to their own village. Any human who was caught doing that would no doubt wind up being called rather nasty names. Oh, but if you think that you can just have your way with me and then get this room all to yourself, you should know it's not going to be that easy. I won't settle for just anyone, you know. I'm not that kind of pixie. My mother has given me two years to find a suitable mate, so I'm not about to jump the first human I meet and call it a day. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. Although, now I think about it, I suppose that wouldn't be too bad. I do want to go home as soon as possible after all, and humans are a pretty safe bet when it comes to breeding. So what's your family's medical history like? Any repeated incidents of heart disease or other hereditary illnesses? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Excellent, in that case, I might put you on the list of candidates after all. You see, pixies have a pretty low survival rate out in the wild. Our children are initially very weak, and quite susceptible to illness. Furthermore, we tend to give birth to at least a dozen offspring at a time, and our gestation period is only two months, so we're prime targets for predators. But if I give birth in a safe place like this, and the father's family has a clean medical history, then it shouldn't be a problem. If I'm lucky, the entire litter might survive. Wow, I begin to back away from ticks. She seems like a nice, cheerful person, but in a certain sense, she's kind of scary. Going off current impressions, Tix might just be more of a handful than Ray. Putting all of his talk of breeding aside for the second, did you happen to attend the opening ceremony this morning? Opening ceremony? Oh yeah, of course I did. What kind of idiot would have missed something so important? I mean, yeah, uh, I know, right? I force a smile onto my face and continue. But let's say that someone did miss the ceremony, or fell asleep halfway through. What do you think would be the most important thing for them to know? You mean like, if I were to summarise the key points? 
Yeah, yeah, like that. Hmm. Tix tilts her head to one side and immerses herself in thought. Let's see. Pride of the city, use magic responsibly, stop kicking the back of my chair. No, I don't think there was anything really important covered. Oh, but they did mention that we're going to receive our allowance at the start of each week. Oh, I see. I smile wryly as I catch another glimpse of Tix's nature. Please don't let me be in the same class as this girl. So, anyway, now that we're good friends, don't you think it's time you introduced yourself? Or is it a human custom to arrogantly ask questions of someone they're meeting for the first time? Oh, rather than reciprocate Tix's passive aggression, I exhale deeply and then look it in the eye. Right, where are my manners? I'm Sable Labia, 18 year old human. This is my first time living in the dorm, or having a roommate even. I'll try not to inconvenience you, so if I do anything wrong, please don't hesitate to tell me. I smile and bow my head, immediately eliciting a gasp of surprise from Tix. Wow, that was pretty good. How do you put on a genuine smile like that while harboring such negative emotions? I tilt my head up and gaze at Tix in confusion. Negative emotions? Yeah, you were just feeling something like, wow, I'm so jealous of this beautiful pixie, but the whole time you had a bright smile on your face. How do you do that? Most of the humans who I've met can't mask their feelings at all. I'm honestly taken aback. Although her words don't match my thoughts, she's completely correct about me harboring negative feelings toward her, despite my smile. Most people will point out that my feelings were obvious given Tix's rude words, but from the way she spoke, Tix make it sound like she could feel what I was feeling. Tix, you can read thoughts. Thoughts? Oh no, I simply noticed the changes in your complexion, breathing and posture. Despite the smile you are, you took a defensive stance, your breathing quickened, and a slight tinge of red appeared in your face. For a race which survives on reading danger signals from predators, gauging the emotions of a human being is frightfully simple. Wow, you're scary, you know that? What did you just call me? Oh, I'm just saying that... A fairy, was it? You think I'm a fairy? Oh, no. I instinctively back away, as Tix emanates danger, unbefitting her small stature and acute face. Her voice is low, and her eyes narrow. She looks like she's about to pounce at any second. Anyway, it's about time I return to the cafe. I would want to keep my new friends waiting. I'll talk to you later, okay? I walk past Tix and head for the door. The moment I reach for the doorknob, however, something takes hold of my arm. Oh, you trying to escape? So, that's how humans do things. You commit a grave offence and then walk away and pretend it never happened. Is that what's going on here, my friend? Pain shoots up my arm as Tix tightens her grip. Contrary to her small size, Tix is able to exert tremendous pressure. I wouldn't expect this kind of strength from someone twice her size. Is Tix using muscle reinforcement magic? Though the dangers are clear for humans, other species aren't necessarily exposed to the same risks posed by muscle reinforcement magic. For a creature without a skeleton, for example, they may not need to worry about their muscles growing too large and crushing their bones. The undead avoid the risk of passing out from lack of blood. Large muscle-bound creatures like minotaurs can increase their strength many times over before noticing any side effects. In the case of a pixie, the risks are unknown to me, but at the very least, it's safe to say that due to their apparently low survival rate in the wild, muscle reinforcement magic is well worth the risk. Oh, I'm sorry Tix, please forgive me. It was a slip of the tongue and it won't happen again. I desperately plead to the predatory pixie holding me captive. Tix glares at me, looking deeply into my eyes, as if she's trying to measure the sincerity of my statement. After a few seconds, Tix relaxes her grip, and I breathe a sigh of relief. Why didn't you just say so? Of course you're forgiven. Oh wow. I quickly reach for the door, urgently trying to make my escape. Oh, but one more thing before you go. Hesitantly, I turn my head. Yeah. Fairies and pixies are mortal enemies. There's no greater insult for a pixie than to be called a fairy, and vice versa. So, watch what you say, okay? In response to Tix's warning, all I can do is nod silently and then vanish from her sight as quickly as humanly possible. Let's get out of here before she breaks our arm or something. Where to? After dealing with Tix, I no longer feel like meeting up with Ray and Earth. Instead, I decide to head outside and resume my earlier tour of the campus grounds, giving myself time to clear my head before my first lesson at Amadromia can begin. As I wander around the courtyard looking up at the classrooms from outside, reality finally begins to set in. Although I've been taking it easy so far, the fact of the matter is that I'm going to be soon sitting in one of these classrooms, studying subjects not taught in any other facility. On this day, I've become a student of the illustrious Amadronia Academy. With all the detours and encounters I've experienced so far today, it's hard to think of this as a day of study. Even so, that's exactly what it is, my first day at a magic academy. It might seem surreal right now, but the reality of the situation is that I'm soon going to be sitting in the classroom filled with demi-humans studying my brains out. While I realise that we won't 
be doing anything difficult or especially interesting on our first day of class, I'm excited to begin nonetheless. To this day, I've remained completely self-taught. I've never been tutored in magic by someone more experienced than myself, or attended any lectures, or even befriended any other magic user. Everything I know, I learn from researching the work of others and attempting to recreate it myself. I wonder if I'll be able to adapt to a classroom environment. Having attended normal schools until now, I'm no doubt at an advantage compared to other students here like Draken, but as far as actually using magic in front of a full class of students is kind of concerning. Okay, I shudder as I imagine myself failing miserably in front of the class. Even if I'm not socially awkward or afraid of crowds, relatively speaking at least, using magic in front of others is currently a big deal for me. During the entrance exam for Amadronia, I was required to perform basic spells in a private sitting with teachers and administrators. Before that, however, I had never once used magic in front of a complete stranger. It's not that I'm ashamed to be a mage, or embarrassed about my weak output. If anything, it's quite the opposite. I'm proud of myself. I take great pride in what I've accomplished using my own power. I strongly believe that I've realised certain truths about magic which nobody else has, and that I can do things nobody else has figured out how to. But if that's wrong, if I do my best in front of a classroom full of people, and nobody is impressed in the slightest, then where does that leave me? No, I can't afford to start thinking that way. I am onto something, I have made discoveries that nobody else has. Even if my work is found to be derivative or similar to somebody else's, my research is definitely not in vain, and it will have an impact on others. I'm going to become a world-renowned magic researcher, just you wait and see. I unconsciously pump my fist in front of my body as I psych myself up. Uh, what are you doing? Oh shit, I jump to the side as a bemused voice calls out to me from behind. Greeting me with a deadpan expression is Leisha, who seems unfazed by my reaction. Leisha? I've been called as such, yes. Now, are you going to answer my question, Sable? If this is some kind of training or ritual, I'd like to hear about it. I ponder Leisha's words for a moment as I think back over my actions. All I did was walk around with my head down and then pump my fist in front of me. A peculiar sight to be sure, but nothing worth thinking about. Um, is Alicia's level of scrutiny really necessary? I mean, I don't know, we kind of appeared on her radar and she considers us maybe some sort of rival or something. But I don't want to like lie to her because she'll easily work us out, so let's just explain. I sigh out loud and then smile wryly as I address Alicia. No, it's nothing like that. There's really no great meaning behind what I just did and it's certainly not something as important as a ritual. Oh, if there's no meaning behind the action, why do you do it? I scratch my head as I think about how to explain myself. I don't know, it's like, have you ever raised your arms above your head as a sign of victory or placed your hands on your hips while reprimanding someone? No, I've never acted in such a manner. You're kind of doing it now, but sure. How about crossing your arms when you're dissatisfied or tilting your head when you're confused? No, I have not. Okay, you're not making this easy. I hang my head in defeat. I've never realised that such basic behaviour of human beings could be completely absent from races which is so similar to us biologically. No, wait, maybe Alicia does do all those things and she simply lacks self-awareness? If nothing else, she at least seems to alter her facial expressions in the same manner as everybody else. All of those actions you mentioned, are they common among the human folk? I can understand the benefit of altering your stance as a means of conveying intent to a third party. However, the actions of which you spoke all seemed unnecessarily conspicuous and exaggerated. Rather than using such actions to express intent, it seems to me like you humans simply enjoy frivolity. Yeah, that might be true. Maybe it would be best if you just thought of those actions as supplementary methods of communication. Are they? In a manner of speaking, yeah, though we mostly do it unconsciously. I see. Lisha's face warps slightly as she thinks over what I've told her. After a few moments of contemplation, she lowers her head and sighs. How foolish. Why would one wish to make their feelings so abundantly clear and easy to read? To unconsciously announce your feelings to others, I can only see this as a weakness. Says the girl whose facial expressions match her every word. There's no maybe about it. This girl definitely lacks self-awareness. I decide against pointing out the fallacy in Leisha's argument. Instead, I change the topic to something I actually want to discuss. So, Leisha, we meet out here once again. Did you come here straight after the opening ceremony? Indeed I did. Why didn't you go with everybody else in the cafe? Aren't you hungry? Yeah right, like I could eat the pre-processed gruel served en masse by humans. I'm pretty sure none of the staff here are humans. What's more, some of the dishes I saw on the menu were about as far from pre-processed as you can get. Be that as it may, I still feel no desire to eat in that stuffy room surrounded by strangers on every side. 
I would rather spend my time out here, sitting beneath the trees and breathing fresh air. When you put it like that, I can't blame you. Is that really okay though? You might miss something important if you keep going off on your own. Are you truly in a position to say that? I can look up whatever information I need on my terminal, so even if I miss a few lectures, I'll be fine. Oh, that's right, is it? Leisha displays slight frustration as I remind her of the ability which only one of us currently possesses. In that case, I suppose it can't be helped. If I lose my way, I'll come to you for support. Leisha, are you...? Don't misunderstand. I'm merely saying that I'm going to be relying on you as one student to another. We are in the same class after all. It's our responsibility as classmates to support one another. Leisha pouts unhappily while unintentionally sharing her true feelings. You even looked up which class I've been placed in. I did no such thing. I was simply glancing through the names in my class's list and I happened to notice your name was there. It's not like I was searching for your name in particular or anything. Leisha defends herself in a fluster, desperately trying to convince me of the fact that she hasn't given me a second thought since our meeting earlier. You know what, when you get embarrassed, even your ears start to turn red. On an elf, that's actually quite a sight. I'm not embarrassed. Fooling nobody, Leisha clenches her fist and asserts herself once more. Damn, calm down, I'm just messing with you. Man, your friends must have a lot of fun teasing you. A true friend would not seek to harass me in the first place. Where's the fun in that? I smirked to myself and inwardly thanked Leisha. While meeting up with Leisha was not part of my plan when I first came out here, joking around with her has helped me improve my mood to the better. Even if she comes off as a bit unsociable, I think I'm going to be able to get along with her. So, Miss Valedictorian, will you be coming to class shortly, or do you plan on staying out here a while longer? I will show my face in due time. For the moment, however, I wish to refrain from fraternising with the others any more than necessary. Fraternising? I'm talking about our classmates. How could you already have a low opinion of them? I take it that you did not attend the opening ceremony. I raise an eyebrow at Leisha's words and shake my head. I thought as much. Mingling with those cretins would be a waste of time. You'll see what I mean when you enter the classroom. Leaving behind those ominous words, Leisha begins to walk away, heading in the opposite direction of the academy. Wherever she's headed, it seems like Leisha is in no rush to join her classmates and I, and before long, I shall find out why. I've got a feeling it might have something to do with a certain other dragon person, but we shall see. Wary of Leisha's warning, I wait outside of my classroom for a few minutes before approaching the door. From outside, I can see through the glass panel on the door, and for a while, I have no idea why Leisha was so hesitant to enter. The students are all quietly sitting on their own, or casually chatting with the person next door. Some have their textbooks out, others are playing with their physical terminals placed on their desks, meant as a stopgap until they can use the spell itself. No matter how many times my eyes scanned the classroom, I failed to notice anything that would merit caution. Making me go, and then it hits me. The moment I walk through the door, the volume of my classmates increases exponentially. Everyone is either sitting on their desk or standing grouped together in the middle of the classroom. I spot one student stuck to the ceiling, looking down the shirts of my female classmates. Another is standing at the front of the classroom, trying out some spell akin to a party trick. Put simply, the entire room is in a state of chaos. What the's going on? What happened to the quiet, well-behaved classmates I observed a moment ago? Was I imagining it? Casting a glance back to the door, I quickly understand what's going on. A sound blocking spells on the door, illusionary magic is on the glass pane. Through the strategic use of two specialised yet not overly complicated spells, the class is able to fly under the radar while doing as they see fit. Even our teacher would have had a hard time punishing my classmates after seeing their creative use of such magic. I can see what Leisha was talking about. It's certainly more peaceful in the courtyard, away from these troublemakers. Maybe I should... Well, Mitt, dear prince, faceless student, who this? Before I can turn around and head back out of the classroom, the strange being appears in front of me. Forgive me for approaching you so suddenly, but I'm afraid I had no choice. The moment I spotted you from across the room, I could not stop myself from making your acquaintance. The person in front of me places his uh, its hand on my shoulder. Leaning in close, it continues to whisper sweet words into my ear. From the unique contours of your body and your supple flesh, there is not a speck of imperfection to be found. Your eyes like gems beckon me closer, even as common sense dictates otherwise. Pray, before I succumb to despair, would you grant this lowly being your name? Motionless, I continue to observe the peculiar person in front of me. It speaks praise with every breath, and exudes a sense of mystery as I ponder its words. But above all else, what surprises me most of all is that I find myself strangely attracted to it. Yeah, I'm Sable, Labia. Sable, such a fitting name for one as transcendental as yourself. Tell me more about yourself. From where do you hail? 
What is your family structure? Have you ever fallen in love? A face begins to form on the blank slate as it continues to speak. The soft, delicate features of a gorgeous young woman begin to manifest, transforming the canvas in front of me into a beautiful girl. My heart skips a beat as I attempt to respond. Who's this person, and how could their appearance change before my eyes? No, did they change, or did my mind simply blank out the moment I saw them? Sable, my love. Oh, my chest tightens once again. A radiant smell is beaming down on me, quickly sapping my strength. I can feel my lips quiver as their faces grow closer. I tell my body to back away, but it's not listening. My own feelings have rendered me powerless. Impossible. Is this what it means to fall in love? To have my own body turn against me? To feel my heart beat harder and louder than ever before? It's almost like... My eyes shoot wide open as I finally realise what's going on. Taking my eyes off the suspiciously attractive woman in front of me, I focus instead on the ether surrounding us. Surely enough, the air is filled with suspicious movements of ether, a clear indication that someone is currently casting a spell. By analysing the abnormal ether patterns in the air around us, I'm able to trace the source of the closest abnormality back to an obvious source. I then disrupt the suspicious flow, at which point my heart immediately begins to slow back down to its usual pace. That's better. Love might be something outside of my comfort zone, but spells are well within my area of understanding. Seriously though, how could I have fallen for that? Even knowing that there was an illusionist in the Karsham, I fell for such an obvious deception. That's kind of embarrassing. Thinking back over what I saw when looking through the glass panel on the door earlier, my conclusion is obvious. The creature in front of me excels in perception altering magic. I'm not in love, I'm just weak of mind. Sable, my dear sweet Sable, where have you been all my life? It feels like only now with you by my side I'm truly back off, buddy. I push away the creature's hand and its face returns to the blank state it once was. And yet, despite its lack of expression, astonishment is evident on the canvas before me. My, that was fast. You're the first being to ever break my spell so quickly. The creature takes a step back, its voice filled with curiosity and joy. Now I really am interested in you. What manner of being are you? How highly are you ranked? I thought you were a mere human, and that is evidently not the case. I shake my head in the sire. I'm 100% human, and I'm not even close to being highly ranked. If I'm the quickest to break your illusion, you're just picking easy targets. The corners of the creature's mouth, or rather the contours where one's mouth would usually reside, rise. Is this thing smiling? You give yourself too little credit, my dear. Before coming here, I ensnared all manner of beings, old and young, male and female, noble and commoner. While you may not be highly ranked, you are undoubtedly quite observant. While the creature's words are not completely accurate, I can't deny that I'm observant in at least one regard. Ether, the mystical energy which courses through the bodies of all living things. Ether is all around us. It pulses through the core of the planet, flows along ley lines, gets carried by the wind, and evil travels through the rays of the sun. Or is it that ether facilitates the movement of the wind and the passage of light? Is ether the reason why the earth spins, and why entities orbit around large dense objects filled with ether? Even in this day and age, when ether is used for so many aspects of our daily lives, there are still countless questions that remain unanswered. Every day theories are proven or disproven, new concepts are tested, and our understanding of magic just grows a little bit more mature. One more reason why ether is so difficult to study is because it's not the same as conventional matter. It's neither a wave nor a particle, it can't be stored in a typical container such as a jar, yet it might inhabit an ancient artifact. Furthermore, Ether is difficult to observe. Most beings cannot actually see ether, even those adept in magic typically just feel the presence, like they would a breeze or the heat of summer. Very few people are capable of seeing ether with their own eyes, and even among those who can, most choose not to do so due to the strain it places on their body. I know this because I am one of those fortunate few. Whatever your background may be, you have without a doubt caught my interest. Please, do me the belated honour of allowing me to introduce myself. The creature smiles and tilts his head forward. My name is Hell, and I am a Nopra Bow. Now before you get the wrong idea, do note that I am not one of those mischievous foxes playing a prank. I am in fact the real deal. Whatever reference Hell is attempting to make is unfortunately lost on me. A Nopra Bow? What the hell's that? I've read about a great number of different demi-humans, but I never heard of one of these before. I silently make a mental note to research the unfamiliar name later on. For the time being, I can only smile wryly and attempt to communicate with the creature. Okay. So then, hell, how now that your cover's been blown? Are you going to at least tell me why you're trying to deceive me? I was not trying to do anything. I succeeded with great ease. 
albeit it was a temporary feat. You know what I mean. A chuckle escapes from Hell's mouthless face. I do indeed. Forgive my deception, but I assure you I meant no harm. I simply have a soft spot for beautiful creatures such as yourself. Beautiful. I raise an eyebrow in response to Hell's unexpected explanation. You do know that I'm a guy, don't you? What relevance does that have? Beauty does not discriminate by sex. Besides, what harm is there in a woman finding a man attractive? I stare at Hell blankly for a moment as I attempt to process her words. My eyes begin to drift from her blank face to her torso and then to her legs. I unconsciously analyse her body, which I'd initially overlooked due to the surprise of seeing her featureless face. You're a woman? Don't get too excited. I might be interested in you, but that doesn't mean I'm easy. You'll have to try hard to win my heart. No, that's not what I meant. Relax, you don't need to explain yourself. You were so captivated by my lovely face that you paid no attention to the rest of my body, am I wrong? My face twitches as I try to come up with a retort. Painfully, however, the truth is that she's right. Setting aside the matter whether it's lovely or not, and whether it can even be called a face to begin with, my attention was indeed initially drawn to the only single part of Hell's body. I'm sorry. Oh, don't worry, I wasn't looking for an apology. I simply wanted the party in which I've taken an interest in to know the real me. The upper portion of Hell's face twitches, almost like she's winking. A moment later, Hell walks away, throwing one hand in the air to wave goodbye. Beautiful creatures, hmm. I shake my head and try to get Hell's face, or lack thereof, out of my mind. To think that such a person is not only in my grade, but also in my class. This is going to be a rough year, isn't it? Taking another book around the classroom, I sigh and hang my head. After a few moments of silent contemplation, I take a free seat near the front of the classroom and wait for class to begin. Okay. Even as the bell signifying the beginning of class rings, the noise emanating from my classroom does not die down. Dampened by the sound blocking spell cast on the classroom door, the ringing of the bell doesn't even reach the ears of the classmates. None the wiser, they continue to talk amongst themselves, happily socialising with one another without a care in the world. As such, it isn't until a familiar figure enters the classroom that my classmates finally begin to settle down. Eris Monty. Our grade's advisor, a succubus, and also this class's homeroom teacher. Hello again, everyone. For those of you who missed the opening ceremony, my name is Eris Monty. I will be acting as both your homeroom teacher and your grade's advisor for the remainder of the year. It's a pleasure to meet you all, and I do hope that we're able to get along. Eris smiles brightly at the class, charming most of the room with ease. Amidst the cheers and swooning, I begin to wonder who would win out of Eris and Hell, should the two ever face off. Before we begin to take attendance, there are a few things that I must discuss with all of you. As you all know, during the first two years at the Academy, you are treated more like school children than university students. You are afforded many freedoms, but you will also be closely monitored and expected to strictly abide by Academy rules and regulations. You will be guided, but not coddled. Everything you need will not be handed to you on a silver platter. If you feel that you will need your hand to be held every step of the way, leave the classroom now, don't come back. Dropping her cheerful facade, Eris glares at the class as she gives us all an unexpected ultimatum. Grow up or get out. It's a hard choice considering that most of the students in this class most likely come from non-human settlements far away. You're all sticking around? Then listen close, because the next part's important. Under no circumstances are you to pester your teachers outside of class. If you need help, ask your classmates or double down on your studies. We're here to teach, not to babysit. We can't give preferential treatment to one student because they bitch and moan about their own ineptitude. In short, deal with your own problems. We will neither be held accountable nor go to any great lengths to help you. In response to Eris's words, the students who she charmed continue to cheer. As for the rest of us, however, the looks on our faces are a mix of disbelief and disgust. Is this woman really a teacher? Before anybody can protest or ask questions, Eris opens her terminal and begins to take attendance. How horrifying. Is such an irresponsible woman truly her teacher? I cannot imagine that an academy as prestigious as this would adopt such an approach toward teaching. This must surely be the will of that woman alone. Yeah, I think you're right. Unfortunately, I missed both the opening ceremony and our orientation day, so I haven't had the chance to hear any different from the principal or any of the other teachers. I skipped orientation day too, but as someone who attended the opening ceremony, I'm afraid I can offer you little solace. That succubus did most of the talking, once she put the majority of our grade under her spell, they refused to listen to any of the other teachers. Worse, our pathetic weakening of a principal didn't even try to stop her. He just nodded his head and allowed her to take control of the entire grade. Wow, I saw her power at work in the cafeteria earlier, but I didn't realise things had already gotten so out of hand. 
Considering how many of my classmates aren't human, I'm surprised to learn that Eris's power seems to work without prejudice. Race and sex have no bearing. Everyone who hears her voice and sees her face falls under her spell. But why was I not affected this time? And why was Leisha spared? Is it a matter of perception? Is it because we both possess strong control over ether and we've unknowingly started to build up a tolerance to such spells? I gotta look into this. Finding the situation somewhat odd, I add one more peculiarity to my mental list of things to research later on. After doing so, I turn to Leisha. By the way, why did you decide to sit next to me? You've been in a half every time you've spoken. I figure that I'll be the last person you'd want to sit next to. Yeah, don't think so highly of yourself, human. You do not merit that level of consideration. I sat here because I wanted to. Do I need a more compelling reason than that? No, I guess not. I'm just thinking that... Quiet. Seize your idle thoughts and focus. The lesson's about to start. After taking the attendance, Eris sighs loudly and leans against the podium at the front of the classroom. She's clearly demotivated and seems to possess no desire whatsoever to teach. Okay, back to teaching first years, huh? What do these shitty brats even know? I'm going to have to start from the basics of the basics, aren't I? Leisha and I glance at one another, confirming that we really did hear our supposed teacher correctly. Oh well, at least there's one advantage to teaching the basics. Eris turns around and raises her hand. She holds her palm out toward the wall, redirecting the flow of ether, such that it creates a large sheet. The sheet lights up, and a large quantity of information is displayed on it. Is that a terminal? I've never made one that big myself, but I suppose there's no reason why a person couldn't make it that big. Just what is this teacher planning? Eris draws the attention of the entire class, and for once, it's not because she's charmed them. Most of the people present have never seen a terminal being used before. Furthermore, as far as I'm aware, the only people in this classroom capable of using them are Eris and Aya. As such, expanding her terminal to such a great size is a surefire way for Eris to captivate the class. After navigating in a seemingly rehearsed fashion, Eris opens a recorded lecture on the origins of Aether. Eris takes her seat, kicks back, and lets the recording do the job for her. Okay, that was pretty easy. Okay, are we done? Seems like it. What a waste of time. If I wanted to watch a recording or listen, I could have just done it from my dorm room. Indeed, not to mention the sheer simplicity of the subject matter. Theories pertaining to ether production? The reason why only some races are capable of using magic? She must be joking. Eris is probably hoping to lose some students by either borrowing them or freaking them out. That is a worrying possibility, and not an unlikely one, given what we just experienced. The lecture focused mainly on students and theories dating back hundreds of years, from a time when human technology could still be considered primitive at best. Graphic descriptions portrayed the dissection of demi-humans both alive and dead, and even delved into the old belief that eating a demi-human's heart would grant a human their powers. For a lecture that was supposed to be about the basics of ether and spellcasting, it wound up being surprisingly confronting. Setting aside Eris's intent, the lecture itself was fairly interesting. There was quite a few controversial topics covered, I can't imagine just any old academy would expose us to that kind of content on the first day. A wager that that too was our teachers doing, rather than the will of the academy. As you suggested a moment ago, it was likely for the sake of horrifying students, rather than teaching them. If so, then our teacher is a truly detestable woman. Sighing loudly, Alicia stands up from her seat and walks into the aisle. With our teacher gone and our classrooms all having risen from their seats, it seems that Alicia herself is now eyeing the door. Leisha, are you off? Our next class is in this room too, shouldn't you stay put? You'd have me remain in this crowded classroom being assaulted by unintelligible babbling from every side. Don't be ridiculous, I shall take my leave, and then return once the next lesson's about to begin. Leaving behind those few words, Leisha walks over to the door and promptly leaves the room. My classmates on the other hand all continue to hang around the classroom in small groups chatting loudly, just as they were before class began. Leisha's got a point, maybe I should take a break too. I'm certainly not going to get anything done like this. I mean, you could talk to some of your classmates and kind of be a bit more social, but I guess not. And I think that that will do for this gameplay. We have kind of met our roommate and we had our first class of the year. This is Ushio signing off and hopefully I'll see you next time.